hello. So we did Enrique's journey for our book club, and I think uh, Mateo is going to start us off. Yeah, um, I'll be going over the plot of Enrique's journey, because uh, there's at one point there's a quote that goes, um, the Odyssey, an epic poem about a hero's journey home from war, ends with reunion and peace. The Grapes of Wrath, the classic novel about the Dust Bowl and migration of Oklahoma farmers to California, ends with the death and glimmer of renewed life. Enrique's journey is not fiction, and its conclusion is more complex and less dramatic. I actually disagree with the ending of that quote. I don't think it's that much more complex, and I think it's underselling how dramatic it actually is. Because I do think that Enrique's journey is a hero's journey. This is a simplified model of the hero's journey, broken up into eight steps. You need, go, search, find, take, return, changed. All the elements of the hero's journey... And how does Enrique's life fit into that? So it starts off, he's living in Honduras with his mother when uh, Lourdes, his mother, leaves to go for the United States. She does this to financially support her family because they don't have the best financial situation. And she leaves. She plans to only go for a year or two. And it goes on for much longer than that. Because, yeah, Enrique, in this moment, this is his grounding. This is him. This is the life he knows. And then we go to what he needs, which is 13 years later, Enrique is lonely. He hasn't seen his mother in 11 years. He's desperate to see her again. He's been kicked around through family. But what he wants more, what he needs is to see his mother. So with that, he decides to go on a journey to uh, through uh, Guatemala and Mexico, mostly focusing on Mexico, as he tries to reunite with his mother. That take while most of the journey is taken through Mexico, that leads us to search, which is his actual journey. Everything that happens, him traveling along the tops and sides of the train cars, along the way he faces conflicts from robbers, gangsters, corrupt cops. He gets deported nine times over the process of crossing through Mexico, and he almost dies on several occasions. He gets pushed off the train at one point. He, he faces his life. That's his journey. But eventually he finds what he's looking for and he arrives in Nuevo Laredo, which is the border between the U.S. and Mexico at the Rio Grande. This is his point where he can now finally cross over. He's finally, it's right there. He's at the home stretch. He's just got to get over. So while he's there, he spends some time making money. He washes cars for a little bit. He begs for a little bit, just anything to get him money because he's trying to save up to contact his his mother and back in Honduras to contact them, to contact his mother because he lost all the information about her. He then he does eventually do that, which gets him, which once he's in contact with his mother, he tells her about smugglers and she's able to wire money to the smugglers once they cross. And that gets them to take him across the border. So he's now finally able to enter the U.S. And once he's in the U.S., he re he returns to his mother. He goes on the journey. He goes to Orlando, Florida for a little bit. And he eventually makes his way up to North Carolina when he finally reunites with his mother. And that leads him changed. After his journey, after nine times being deported, 11 years, it doesn't end well for him. He resents his mother for leaving them, for being alone for so long. And Lourdes, his mother, on the other hand, is angry at him because she believes that she has sacrificed being with him to financially support him. And now that he's finally here, she's ungrateful. So she, he, both of them have changed in the process over these past 11 years. And that's where their hero's journey ends. Any questions? No, that's an awesome recap. Thank you, Mateo. That was, that was perfect. Yeah, that was really well done. I like the visual, too. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump in next and talk about the um, just journalism and writing style of this story. So I'm not sure if y'all know this, but um, originally this book was shared as a six part series in the Los Angeles Times. Um, I'll share that link with you here in a little bit um, in case you're interested. But as a fellow newspaper reporter, I really appreciated Sonia Nazaria's commitment to going on the same journey as Enrique to provide readers with an authentic story rooted in facts. It's clear to me that Nazario did immense research to hunt down sources to interview, find places to stay, figure out her route, um, 
provide credible statistics and data. Um, coming back to interviews too, throughout the book, we hear from so many different voices. We're not just a part of Enrique's journey. We hear from priests, shelter hosts, fellow migrants, corrupt police, and even cartel and gang members. Um, and it is not easy to find sources like that to talk to you on the record, which I also think speaks to Nazario's compassionate and trusting personality. She talks about how risky this trip was for her, not only because of train hopping, as we know, is life threatening, or because she, like many other women who went on this journey, could have been raped. Um, it also impacted her marriage and personal life, like she mentions in the introduction. So for all of these reasons, from a journalistic perspective, I really um, think her devotion to truth and understanding firsthand what this journey looks like is, is worthy of applause on its own. Um, all of that said, I personally was not a big fan of the writing style. I felt like she went on this journey. Um, she heard from so many people, these really heart-wrenching stories. And I felt like the book could have been more emotionally compelling. And I just, I felt like it missed the mark in that way. Um, to me, it felt like maybe she just had so much information and so many vignettes <laughs> that she didn't want to cut anything out and maybe got overwhelmed. Um, and rather than like choosing some to elaborate on, it just kind of felt crammed in. Like she was just trying to fit it all there and it, it came across as a little choppy and dry sometimes. Um, and to be honest, that might be because right before I read this book, I read a YA book called We Are Not From Here by Jenny Sanchez Torres, which um, also kind of had a similar storyline. Uh, it followed three teens as they made a journey from Guatemala to the US border. And um, I just felt like that book was so emotionally gripping, like there would be pages of talking of, you know, the really psychological impact of seeing, you know, someone decapitated in front of you on a train, whereas Nazario, I just felt like would kind of put it as a one off sentence. Um, and to me, that just felt like it did a disservice to those traumas these people experienced. Um, so that to me was a little off-putting, but I will say there's instances where the abrupt anecdotes actually made the reality of the journey maybe more shocking or haunting. You know, you'd read something offhandedly and you'd be like, whoa, wait, what? She just moved on from that, you know? Um, another aspect of the book I did appreciate too is that it included two sections of photojournalism. So really having a visual of candid in the moment, not posed imagery that shows us the real faces, feelings, landscapes of this journey, I thought, um, was a nice, nice addition. Um, so to wrap up, this wasn't my favorite piece of writing. I do still have tremendous respect for Nazario and the work she does. You know, she writes about ethical dilemmas of writing this book, including on page 261, when she, when Lords asked her for help in finding a lawyer. Um, and she explains thoughtfully her decision to step in and then disclose what she did to help so that her journalism ethics weren't blurred. Um, one thing that I won't go into detail herein because it would just get off topic and in the weeds, um, but I'm very passionate about journalism ethics and um, Nazaria had been berated in the past actually for some of her other stories and um, just things get really complicated. So I did wanna share with y'all a few um, interesting journalism stories and blog posts about journalism ethics, um, speaking to her reporting specifically on Enrique's journey. So I'll share those with you in the chat here in just a moment. Um, Cause that's something I, I personally feel strongly about um, that we should all learn to as we read the news. Um, so overall, I felt like the writing itself was a little dry and could have been stronger. I'd maybe give that like a two out of five. But in terms of telling like a harrowing and very important story, like this topic is obviously very important. And so for that reason, I'd give Enrique's journey a five out of five. Um, so does anyone have strong feelings on the writing style or want to comment on that or the journalism take? The one thing I will say is from the narrative perspective, part of what makes the writing kind of weird is that like from the narrative you're following Enrique as he journeys through Mexico and then occasionally you'll just stop and you'll focus yeah. on like one like a priest or a nun and their experiences in the community which are good tales and they're important to establish the community and the people you go th that go through this but from a narrative perspective it just completely destroys the pacing 
Yeah, I, I have mixed views on that, I guess, because I like subheads and pulling different people in. And I, I think vignettes can be really strong to sprinkle here and there. I just felt like emotionally, they just felt so glossed over, you know? Um, and I guess if she told the full story of every person, obviously that would be potential for hundreds of books. But yeah, it just, it, it did feel a little abrupt and just not, didn't do a good service, I felt like, to some of those experiences. To, to me, it was kind of like uh, a documentary film where you would be on one scene and then they would shoot over to the other scene and they would be interviewing the priest or Olga Martinez, the, the woman that... Um, so I could see it through sort of a documentary film type yeah. way. And I really, liked, I really liked getting to know the community and all the people along the way. And the shift from... Um, Chiapas, which is pretty violent, and and I mean that's their daily struggle. And I, how did all these immigrants get to the border? I was wondering that, and I never stopped to really research it. And then I thought, this is a constant struggle for the state of Chiapas, and that's why it's so corrupt because they are daily fighting um, illegal immigrants coming in through their state to get to the north. And I really liked the story of Padre Leo and that's how she yeah. found him. I mean, it was through her investigation. You know, I just thought of it, would, you know, as a documentary film. That's the yeah. movie I got yeah. going on in my head with all the different, you know. Yeah, I also had a, a different take on the, the type of storyline progression. And it also relates a little bit to the um, the psychology, the inner psychology of what's happening to Enrique, the viewer and everything. So um, similarly, I, I did see it as a, a more of like a narrative, like a documentary style. But I'm wondering, and this could be subconscious on the author's um, behalf, that maybe she was trying to really elicit the compartmentalization that happens during these types of traumatic events, especially long term traumatic events. Um, even when we uh, try desperately to remember all the, the things that we experience, especially when they're traumatic, um, our body isn't necessarily capable of, of being able to perceive all that. And that was one of the, I think, one of the most important parts of this book in general was that psychological effect um, on Enrique and the people around him. Um, he, was, uh, he was given some very hard uh, times growing up. I mean, of course, poverty of course um, his father um, being distant and having other relationships and things like that and alcoholism um, but the primary i think uh, main aspect of this and this goes on to his hero's journey which i do believe was resolved in a very positive way at the end um, is that that idea of the absent mother the mother who either is um, hurt killed or missing or sometimes leaves there's so much that goes into the inner psychology of how a child relates biologically and psychologically to its mother. And that can include many of the things that we would take for granted, like um, feeling safe and feeling comfort and um, feeling like as though you have a place within a family and that you're gonna be taken care of. Now, when those things disappear, um, the inner psychology doesn't. So when the mother was able to uh, get to the United States and leave Enrique behind, um, she never really left him in the sense that she was always present as this figure who still represented those things. It just, he was not, did not have access to her. And this became an obsession. And this obsession is what drove him to leave the United States and many other children just like him who uh, tried to reunite with their mothers because of that savior aspect that happened psychologically when we, um, relate to our, our parents and our mother in particular. Um, in addition, when he was involved in this journey, like we had discussed before, it was incredibly traumatic. It was from one event to another of, of one awful thing happening to a child Absolutely. to the next. And as these, as these events piled up, uh, he was um, really making it incredibly hard for himself to live a normal life afterward. Uh, when he arrives in the United States and finally meets his mother and realizes that that psychology that had kept him going all those years was just an illusion and that she was a normal human being like everyone else. Inevitably, he turned back into his, his drug use and into his uh, distancing himself from the people that he loved. 
Um, but by the end of the story, he really seems to come to terms with this uh, understanding and ends up reconciling as best as you can with these types of trying situations um, back with his mother. Now, the reason why this is uh, so important, especially as a, a book about young um, students and young children who are coming to the United States, is that they are going to be going, they're going to be coming from the ages of you know, nine trying to get to the United States. And every single time that they enter into a new traumatic event, that traumatic event is going to stay with them their entire lives. Um, the uh, National Educational Associ uh, Association um, said that uh, after decades of research, uh, even as little as one traumatic event can have some serious long-term effects on a child, including um, PTSD, including uh, depression, including um, alcoholism, smoking, um, abuse, all of these things uh, that get ingrained into the brain as a possible solution to a very hard uh, traumatic event. Um, in particular, in the United States alone, one in six adults has experienced four or more um, traumatic events in their lives. And this is going to eventually, you know, uh, make it so that their futures are going to be held on to these traumatic events. And so with Enrique's journey, I think that it's important to remember that um, he is one of many, many children to like himself who does make that journey to the United States and end up being in our classrooms. And so it's important to remember that um, they have gone through some things that really require patience and they really require um, an understanding of the internal workings of how that can affect the child psychologically. That's a really powerful point too that you just made, Patrick, about the fact that we we will have students that have gone on these journeys in our classrooms and like having that understanding is so important. Absolutely, like educating ourselves more on this journey and what that means psychologically. I'm glad you pointed that out. Patrick, that was so well put and so eloquent. And I think you touched on so many details that are like commonly glossed from just the natural reading. <clears throat> One of the things that I did want to say was that by having all these chopped little narratives, it doesn't make it feel as if there is ever really truly character progression because so quickly you see Enrique doing one thing like on drugs and then he's off drugs and he's working and then he goes back onto drugs and it all happens so fast that it really doesn't give you time to process everything that he's going through. But I think just in you highlighting the point that maybe if we peer into Enrique's mind and see if maybe this is how he tells his story, like an abrupt compartmentalization of all these very traumatic experiences, that definitely puts it in perspective. And I think that's a much more empowering way to think about it rather than just like, you know, a more typical dry narrative, which at times it did appear to be. Yeah, the um, effects of, of these types of traumatic events I mean, it can be anywhere between physical abuse or even emotional abuse that he was experiencing at the hand of his father's family. You know, it, it wasn't just his mother who left him, his father left him. And then the people that his father left him with left him. And he was always looking for that comfort again. And, and even it's very predictable that he what he did have end up having a young child um, at a young age looking for that that type of connection, yes. trying to find that motherly love with from another um, woman his age. Um, but this is uh, pretty common um, when you see that, including the substance abuse, the psychological um, wanting to move away and heal. But the only obstacle that you have is yourself. And so the only thing that you can do is to try to um, feel better through these different types of illicit substances. I did just want to touch on this um, concept that's coming up in Patrick's synopsis of um romanticization and like building up ideas of how things are perceived to be when really they're not. So I had some examples that I wanted to share here really quick. I'm just going to gloss over some um, quotes, but I said, um, the book as a whole explores the theme of the American dream and the internalized narratives we convince ourselves of that romanticize the idea of other places so much so that we delude ourselves from the reality of what they are. So like, for example, um, well, I'll just say, I'll just put it this way, like the things that Lourdes would send Enrique, like to him, he built up this amazing confidence about what America was like, purely off of these material possessions. And e even from her perspective, as a mother who was sending them, these weren't even possessions of status, but because they were in, you know, Honduras, where he was, they were imported. So he started building this idea that 
you know, she was doing so much better. She had all this wealth. She had all of this, I don't know, um, just ability and opportunity there. And so he started kind of romanticizing this idea of what America was like. And I think even at the beginning of the book, we get a pretty good glance into Lourdes' mind of why she thought in the first place it was a good idea to go to America. Um, the quote, let me share it really quick. Um, Lourdes knows of only one place that offers hope. As a seven-year-old child delivering tortillas to her mother made to wealthy homes, she glimpsed, she glimpsed this place on other people's television screens. The flickering images were a far cry from Lourdes' childish, childhood home, a two shack, a two-room shack made of wooden slats, its flins, flimsy tin roof weighted down with rocks, the only bathroom a clump of bushes outside. On television, she saw New York City's spectacular skyline, Las Vegas's shimmering lights, and Disneyland's magic castle. So, I mean, immediately we see why she had a motivation to go there and this sort of idea and mentality that she could have all of those things when she got there and how life would be so much easier and she'd have, you know, money opportunity. But then we see really quickly throughout the whole story, like, she was forced back into poverty. She dealt with just as many life-threatening situations as if she was living back in her hometown. And then not only all of that, but she was separated from her children. So then they had all of this psychological trauma they had to carry with them about that separation and how basically they weren't to them, they weren't good enough for her to just continue her life there with them. And I don't know, I found that to be the most insightful. I think it displays also a lot of, um, systemic oppression that immigrants have to go through once they get here in America and how Lord of this was always kind of posed down because of her status and people always she even uses like systemic fear against Enrique at one point saying like I'll call the cops on you because they'll put you away and started using these really internalized oppression narratives against even you know her own son people who have to deal with the same struggle um so yeah Super insightful. I thought there was a lot to take away from this, but I think there's a lot of good overlaps with everything that you said, Patrick. Yeah, the illusion of the American dream, right? Um, even the people in the United States who uh, grow up in the United States still believe what we're told, right? The, the old Horatio Elgers of the early 1900s of rags to riches story, which was a complete farce when it was made up and put into the papers and continue to be a pervasive understanding of what it's like to be in the United States for a long time. And that can be traumatizing in itself when you realize that Camelot is a story and that there is no King Arthur that's gonna be able to unite and bring everyone together. So it's a very tragic in many ways and very few of them um, you know, are physical traumas. Yeah, I love Daniel that you used that quote too about Disneyland and everything. I think we talked about that in our first um, our first book club meeting. But yeah, I think that's just such a a profound example of like this shiny dream that, you know, is the American dream and it's totally a myth, you know? Yeah, just this internalized idea that, you know, you start just thinking about so much and then putting up on this such high pedestal. And then like when Enrique comes and he sees everything, there's another quote I wanted to share, but he's basically like, you came here for opportunity and you have nothing. There's nothing for you here. And this whole time I thought you were gone because you wanted all of that. I, I think I know exactly which quote you're talking about there. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. The dialogue in the book was really strong. I did feel like too, the quotes that she did pull in were like really like strong quotes from people. My topic was parental responsibilities. And I mean, I, I've lived in Brazil for 25 years. So I've seen a lot of the, just the cultural um, expectations of women in especially living in poverty that the, the the women kind of have to take over the whole role of the family and in this case she had her two children she was living with her mother they were selling bread or other things around and she really ha could not think of any other options and somewhere I read, I can't remember exactly where, that she was avoiding going into prostitution, which is a very common fallback for women who want to feed their children when the man, when the man or the husband has, has left. So it's very uh, easy to 
judge women and say they've, you know, they've abandoned their children when the it all begins with the father abandoning the children in the very beginning. So they are left with everything and all the responsibility. In terms of Lourdes, I, I feel like she was desperate and she and she wanted to come back after a couple of years. She really felt it. And that disillusion with coming to the United States is that you can save a lot of money and then go back. Well, life, especially in California, where she was first, was not about um, being able to save any money. I mean, that was just not going to happen. And she got robbed several times from a fake lawyer trying to get help. She was trying to get residency so she could bring them. And, and, and the corruption and the, and the, and the crime were uh, a fake lawyer. You know, and for her to earn a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and I mean, she's giving up a lot. So, mm -hmm. in terms, of, in terms, I'm not going to repeat what Patrick said because he said he said a lot of good, of, of good things. But the, you know, when in, when Enhiki was living with his with his father, his father, they had they, if he'd had his father present, he would have had a lot of a lot a better outcome as a child but it was a cycle i mean this is a whole vicious cycle and as i was as adopted child i was adopted as a child i know the whole illusion of oh if i just find my my real mother if i just find my biological mother it'll all make sense and all and the, the fantasy of that that adopted children also also go through um the trauma of being left so and then the, the cycle with Maria, Maria Isabel, and you know, she was she was strong enough to know she didn't want to get pregnant, but she she got caught up in the cycle and didn't protect herself. I mean, there was a time when she said she wanted to use protection. So there is access at some point, at least in Brazil in poor communities, I know there is access to family planning or birth control or especially condoms. Why, you know. It's it's a it's an emotional trauma that people are going through, and they feel like, well, if I if, if I have a baby, then he won't leave me again. And so she she feels bad, probably thinking, well, if I have his baby, then he'll he will change and he'll stay with me, and he won't take off to the United States. Uh, so I and then I the I was thinking a lot about the the familial capital that is available in in communities of of poverty because they do depend on everybody in their family um you know they don't they don't have the option of shipping enrique off to a drug rehabilitation center or something where he can get help or psycho psychological help they don't have that they rely on family but unfortunately you know he did have a an uncle who tried to give him support as when he was a teenager and sniffing a lot of glue and smoking a lot of marijuana. But then that fell through too. And, and what his uncle was doing was that last survival. You know, he was going to the border to exchange money and he was going to do it one last time. He knew it was dangerous, but still he risked it. And so not only did Enrique live, lose his uncle, two uncles, the grandmother was left now with one of the uncle's children and a whole household. And she lost income too, because those uncles were also helping her out. So the, the family responsibility is just a site. It's a vicious cycle. It just, it goes on. And, and I feel like the, you know, the, 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 the goal of the author of this book is to maybe um, enlighten women before they make this journey that it's, you know, the psychological trauma that their children will be left with and that in El Salvador and Honduras. And I mean, just the gangs that, I mean, that's what kids resort to when they don't have parental guidance growing up. And ironically, it's to seek that community that they're now lacking. It's a cycle, and and as a teenager, when you're a teenager in a in a poor community, I mean, you have to either have really strict parents who are going to keep their eye on you, 
or you join a gang and that becomes your family. Yeah. So I think he was very, very brave to, to, even though he was, you know, disillusioned or whatever, he was very brave because there's also a part in families that, um, I mean, my family is not a good example because it's a little dysfunctional, but the, the Latin families, they do have um, this obligation that they are responsible for each other. And so even if his mother was not in a good situation in the United States, he still felt he needed to find her and be with her and that he would take care of her. And she, in the same time, also had the responsibility to take care of the abuela of her mother in in Honduras and you know that she uh, how, you know that that's just kind of a natural progression of things is that you know I'm going to take care of my mother when she's older in many senses and, it's their connections that are kind of being exploited by and it, by the, the oppressive powers in both countries in Honduras yeah. and all the way up to the United States and his addiction, you know, that he, he developed as a young kid, that was his safety net. That's how he could forget everything and, and the pain. And I was actually pretty impressed that he stuck with um, Maria Isabel and, and brought her to the States. And then they got there. I mean, that was, that was huge because he didn't have to do that. I mean, he could have, you know, moved on like i mean he did later he they separated but um maria isabel lives with lourdes and their two kids and they're very close and hiki enrique has now gone off and ha he, i guess he has a new wife but it's basically because he can't give up his drinking habits and lourdes is a very religious person so i mean she kept it together i think did you see the part how they brought the daughter through the tel on the television show? There's a video on YouTube that shows it. Aww. So, and she didn't, that. she wasn't gonna stay. I mean, she could, they got the television show, got her a visa to come to appear on this tele, you know, those emotional tearjerker TV shows because she had a 40 day old infant back in Honduras that she wasn't gonna leave. So she came, I don't know probably for a couple of days and then went back. But they have met. And and um, Belki did manage to get an education. I mean, she has, she finished high school and she has some other technical training. And I think she has a small business, uh, maybe a hair salon or something, but she has managed to move up slightly in Honduras. Yes, that brings us up to the symbolism in the book. So okay. planes, um, they're dangerous and they represent poverty. So the networks are treacherous. They're not always reliable. They place emphasis on saying that the train that devours, El Tren de Borador. I may have chopped that up, but um, you know, they stop at these spots along the way and people provide food to the migrants, the community members that you know, sympathize, empathize, that feel for them, that have seen this journey so many times. And can you imagine that, that there's so many children that become adults on this journey that, you know, it's just horrendous, it's tragic, it breeds intergenerational trauma that's perpetuated throughout not only Mexico, but the United States and Enrique, he finds himself going to shelters. He finds himself going to different uh, churches, facilities, and he's always trying his best to put his best foot forward. At one point, he actually wears two left shoes. And I remember he gets help. He washes a car for f money. And then when he starts on this journey again, he wears his two left shoes all over again. And just this harsh reality that we're enlightened about that the author highlights is really um, beyond interesting, it's beyond comprehension. Uh, of course, she has biases and we're all predisposed to biases, but I'm wondering now um, what other narratives are related to this journey and others 
what other insights can we gain from this outside of this, um, you know, documentary like book? Because I'm sure there's other accounts out there. I'm sure there's other uh, individuals who guest speak, whether they use their name or anonymously. And it would just be so insightful just to have this data, um, just to have, you know, what the reality looks like from their viewpoint. And that ties over the whole symbolism within the book. I think this, this is a great example of how we, you know, as teachers, we get children to write their own stories. You know, if we can get children to create their own narratives. It's hard too, Jeremy, because, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> did you want to continue? I'm sorry, Heather. No, no, no go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, it's hard too because you want to hear direct sources and you you want to hear the lived experience of the person who's gone through it. But then again, like Patrick was saying, like you're basically asking them to relive and retell all of their trauma. So it's it's very hard. It there's no experience like the person of the one who's lived it. But then at the same time, it it's hard for that person too to even try and educate others about it. Something I had wanted to touch on, but I didn't know that I would have time was just. Um, you know, that, that reliving those experiences, um, even from her perspective, when, you know, she mentioned that she, she got to stay in hotels along the way, you know, like she, she did have privilege. She knew she was protected along this journey with the sources that she built, like, um, but even, even still, like she experienced trauma, seeing firsthand what people were going through. And so recounting that when you're writing, I mean, it kind of makes sense that maybe parts would have felt dry because how hard is that to sit down at a computer afterward and recount every moment? I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced any of those, like um, seeing dead people or seeing people in extreme circumstances like that, but it really never goes away. And she put herself through that and, you know, she suffered the consequences and made the sacrifice for her art. And that Enrique's journey for me was just um, about putting into perspective what others are facing, um, putting into perspective that um, we have an opportunity um, to not only study social justice to be informed, but to actually problem solve these. Um, I'm sure that we'll meet students, individuals in the community that have experienced these themes maybe not all these things, but a few of these things, and that we are prepared, we are here to listen, and we are here to problem solve and make changes in a positive way with our energy. And make them feel concluded, yeah, definitely. I forgot to read my quote, can I read it? Okay, Latina immigrants ultimately pay a steep price for coming to the United States. They lose their children's love. Reunited, they end up in conflicted homes. Too often, the boys seek out gangs to try to find the love they thought they would find with their mothers. Too often, the girls get pregnant and form their own families. In many ways, these separations are devastating Latino families. People are losing what they value most.